Back to basics, API design. I'm Jason Turner, if you're in the wrong room. Go ahead and leave now. Oh, there's someone leaving, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so my name is Jason Turner. I'm host of C++ Weekly, and I'm an author. I've got puzzle books, ooh, and best practices books. And if you say something interesting or have good feedback during the talk, you get one of those, just so you know. Puzzle books are meant to be fun. They're not mean C++ puzzle books. And um, I'm a Microsoft MVP since 2015, which I'm proud of. I am independent, available for training, code reviews, contracting, that kind of thing. If you want to get in touch with me, I've got cards, whatever, talk to me after the session or look up that URL. Okay, so one of the main rules in my talks are move to the front because you're gonna wanna interact. I see you in the back section. Yeah. Um, please interrupt me and ask questions. This is not a hold your questions until the end of the talk talk. This is a yell things out, which I know makes for a terrible experience for the online people. I'm sorry, but uh, that's how we roll here. I will do my best to repeat the questions and comments as they come up. This is approximately how my training days look, by the way. Oops. Uh, so, in the topic of, well, speaking, I got the chance to practice this talk at my local meetup. We already have a online question. Oh, that's interesting. Can online attendees get books if we're interested in them? You can, online attendees can buy books if they are interested in them, yes. <laughs> I will just quickly say those are the URLs for the online attendees. <laughs> okay, I figure you had the chance to screenshot it by now if you wanted to. All right. Um, so I got this, I gave this talk at my local meetup, I previewed it there, which means I have absolutely no idea how long this talk is going to take because my meetup hardly let me get past the first half of the talk within an hour. We'll see what happens. But I want to ask, do you live in a city with a C++ meetup? Go ahead, raise your hand if you do. Sort of. That's a fair number of people. Okay. Do you attend your local meetup? Not as many people as who know that they have a meetup. Do you live in the Denver, Boulder, Longmont area by any chance? Yeah, okay, okay. I recognize many of you. Do you come to my meetup that is in this area? Who's this group right here who all raised your hands? You live here and you don't come to my meetup. Come to my meetup. Check it out. Okay. Um, so I was asked to give a talk about and the base, back to basics track on API design. I can do that, said me. Sorry, that's a. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, so more seriously, this is outside of the kind of things that I tend to talk about at conferences. And this is largely taken from material I normally leave for my classes. So you should hire me to come and do training at your company. Shamelessly self-promoting here. But I will be focusing on number 32 from my best practices book here, which is make your API hard to use wrong. That's what we're gonna be focusing on during this talk. I am going to show you code, and you're gonna tell me if the API is easy or hard to use wrong, or if you want to argue some gray area. So, highly interactive is the goal. And maybe something about Constexpert. I have to stay on brand, right, for those of you who are laughing. Okay, so let's take the humble standard vector C++ 98 declaration, and I ask you, is this slice of the API easy or hard to use wrong? Well, okay, okay, so who says it's easy to use wrong? Okay, who says it's hard to use wrong? Oh, okay. So for those of you who said easy to use wrong, why? It looks like a verb. Is it a question or is it a command? 
Is it a question or is it a command? Okay. Um, so what does empty do? It returns true if there are no elements in the vector. What happens if I drop the return value from this function? Is it, is it a bug if I drop the return value from this function? In my code, in the calling code, does my code have a bug? Probably. Who says yes, definitely a bug if I call this function and I don't do anything with the return value? Okay, who says probably a bug? Who says, nah, that's fine? Hmm, okay. <clears throat> and then I asked the question of what kind of error handling does this have, but we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, so how would you rewrite this? No discard, thank you, Anthony. Or is empty. So, something like this, perhaps. No discard is empty, okay? So, we'll dig into what no discard means in just a second here. Is, are we at the easy or hard to use wrong now? Do we say now that this is, okay, uh, let's start with the easy side. Who says this is easy to use wrong? Uh, no one is raising your hands now, interesting, okay. Who says this is hard to use wrong? Who is trying to catch up and is still not sure what we're talking about? Okay, uh, we will we'll dig in a little bit more. But I also ask, is there any uh, error handling to this function? Is there in a, any reasonable way that an error condition could occur here? Ooh, someone, wait, who said yes? Was it Shay? No, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, okay, okay, what kind of, who said yes for real? Where was that? Okay, why did you say yes? The vector might be moved from. <laughs> if the vector's moved from, the standard actually does specifically say, well, it gives us guidance here, right? So something that's been moved from should be in what kind of state? Valid but unspecified. So it's possible I've moved from this and I call is empty and it returns false. Or it's possible I, it's been moved from and I call is empty and it returns true. But in either case, it's not an error condition. It's an, it's an unspecified condition, I would argue. What's that? The signature allows it to throw, and you don't know if it throws or not. Is that better? Okay, so I specified no except here. Do we have anything left to talk about for this function? I, I'm actually asking. <laughs> it's not a trick question here. Okay. So we'll start with uh, use better naming. So naming is hard. As we know, the two hardest problems in computer science are cache invalidation, naming, off by one errors, scope creep, <laughs> and bounds checking. I, I, I shamelessly stole this just for the record. Apparently the first two is from Phil Carl Carlton. It's unknown who added the off by one and Dave Stagner added the, the rest of them. Uh, okay, so let's start with no discard. This instructs the compiler to generate a warning if a return value is dropped. It can be applied to types or function declarations. Now, I know for those of you who are like standards committee members, you will argue that the compiler is not required to give you a warning if you ignore this return value. On line four, your compiler is not required to give you a warning. It's a quality of implementation issue. If your compiler doesn't give you a warning in this case, you should probably find a new compiler. This is pretty clear cut. Who's familiar with no discard? It's a pretty good group in the room, okay. 
Did you know that C23 fixed a minor loophole in the standard that did not allow you to apply no discard to a lambda? You have to appreciate the sheer quantity of brackets in this case. So we are specifically applying no discard to the call operator of the lambda in this case. No discard can also be applied to types. So in this code, I can say I have declared some type, it is an error handling type. If you ignore anything that returns this type, then I should get a warning from the compiler. Familiar with this? No? So if you are like from Bjarne's opening keynote when he was talking about in the case of having error code types, perhaps, if you need to avoid exceptions in that code, then uh, this, is, this is a very good thing to do. Make a strong type that is no discard. There's one more place where no discard can be used. Does anyone know where it is? Constructors. So you can mark a constructor as no discard. Um, honestly, I have kind of a hard time coming up with very good examples for this particular use case. Uh, you could say unique pointers, non-empty constructor, perhaps as no discard, but whatever case you might have, if you pass in some value that you need, RAII, who is the person who's talking about RAII as I walked into the room earlier? It was you, right? Yeah. Um, if you have some sort of owning type or something like that, then you can mark the one constructor that needs to, you know, to say it's an error if I call this constructor and then immediately throw away the object, but not an error to throw away, you know, one that was default constructed. Okay. So no discard can be used to indicate when it is an error to ignore a return value from a function can be applied to constructors as of C20, lambdas in 23, and can have a message to explain the error. No discard, some reason. And it should be used extensively. Any non-mutating getter, accessor, const function should be no discard. Now from the hands that I saw raised in the room, I gather that you all have a pretty good grasp on no discard. Uh, should Let's just say, for argument's sake, should the cosine function be no discard? Yes? You all agree? Okay. Um, should vector insert be no discard? Or, asked a different question, what in the world does vector insert return? An iterator to the element that was inserted. Or the first L, wait, what? Oh, if you insert a range, then it returns an iterator to the first element in the range that was inserted, okay. Okay, so should insert be no discard? No, there's plenty of logical use cases to say I inserted something and I don't need the iterator to the thing that was returned. Question. Yes. Can no discard be used for enumerators, enumerations? Oh, like, could I mark an enum type, like a enum struct or whatever, as no discard? I don't think you can. Does anyone know? No, no, you can't, or no, you don't know? I don't think you can. Who asked that? <laughs> Tell them to write a paper and submit it to the committee. <laughs> a diet, uh, I believe. That sounds, that sounds like a really good proposal, doesn't it? It really honestly does. I wish I could give you a book. Uh, tell them to DM me and I will send an ebook code to LeanPub to get an ebook. All right. Um, so, no discard is checked by our compiler for us. Yes? Uh, so the comment was that I'm arguing that we should put no discard everywhere where we have const, and that will clutter our code like no tomorrow. Is that what you said? Okay. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Vittorio says, go to his talk on Thursday. He talks specifically about it. Is that right? I got that right. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a, it is a thing. Um, and we reach a certain point. See, I gave a talk called Applied Const, no, Applied Best Practices at CVPCon 2018? I think it's 2018. Um, and yeah, you do reach a point where you end up with like the no discard, const expert, blah, 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 trailing return type, no accept, and your function declaration is this long. Um, we can certainly argue that at the, well, if C++ were designed today, we would have taken a different take to our defaults. That's, that's the, the truth. But that's where we are at the moment. Okay. So no accept. No accept notifies the user and the compiler that a function may not throw an exception. If an exception is thrown from that function, terminate must be called. So I have this code. The compiler is required to accept this code, just for the record, where I declare it no accept, and then I throw an exception in the body of it. Uh, generally, your compiler is going to give you a warning here and tell you that this function is always going to terminate. I don't think all compilers can give you this warning in all cases, but actually, I'm kind of curious. Let's just see real quick. Hey, look, warning. So that's GCC, throw will always call terminate. And clang gives a similar warning. OK. So the try catch. On, in main on lines seven and nine is irrelevant. It's removed by the compiler. Well, depends on your compiler. GCC probably removes the try catch and it relies on its runtime to catch an unhandled exception and thereby implicitly call terminate. Clang probably actually inserts a terminate call and leaves the try catch there, something along those lines. GCC is scarily good at optimizing this stuff around no accept and exceptions. So summary thus far. Use better naming. Use no discard with reasons liberally. Use no accept to indicate what kind of error handling is being used in your function. Are there any talks this week on factory functions? Factories? I thought I saw one on the schedule, but then, are you giving a talk on factories? Okay. <laughs> when, when is your talk on factories? Thursday, are you up against Vittorio? After Vittorio. After Vittorio, okay. <laughs> okay, so Thursday, which room is it in? In this room, what time? Three and four thirty. 4.30. 4.40. Five. Okay. Um, in this room, we've got no discard and factory functions discussed. Okay. So I'm not hopefully going to overlap too much with what you're talking about. But who was in the last session that was in this room? Small handful of people. Uh, so is this factory function easy or hard to use wrong? <laughs> Easy to use wrong. Okay. Um, what happens if I ignore the return value? Leak? But it might leak. Okay. It could be another reference to a thing. It could be a thing that's in some sort of static holder of all the widgets that have been created so far. It could be a lookup into a singleton. It could be something newly created on the heap. It could be a queue object that's going to automatically clean itself up regardless because of its internal reference counting thing, right? Problem is this API doesn't communicate anything. Um, what is the possible range of input values? 
What did you say? Uh, zero through five. <laughs> Okay, so how would we rewrite this one? Has anyone got any ideas? Make the int an enum. Return a value. Return a value. What type of value? A widget. a widget. Theoretically, okay. If you look at this, do you assume polymorphism is coming into play? That there is an object hierarchy here? <laughs> Type your ice pointer. I assume if I see this, if I see a factory function, I assume there's probably some sort of polymorphism coming into play. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can't return a value, though, because we could have a type erased wrapper, something like std function or something like that, like in concept and principle around it, yes. Could use unique pointer, yeah. That's where the next slide is going anyhow. No discard of a unique pointer. So uh, this is slightly better, at least. Um, who would say that this is easy to use wrong still? Fair number of people, okay. I have books I haven't given away yet, so. That says I still have 38 minutes. Is that right? That's right, okay, good. Um, Okay, so I've now got an enum class, and I'm passing it to make widget. Is this easy to use wrong or hard to use wrong? Harder, says Marshall. Why harder? Uh, yeah, but, well, okay, what is, the, what is the range of input values to this function right now? Slider and button. Slider and button, you say, are the range of uh, valid input values. Okay, what is the valid range of the type called widget type? What was that? All integer values. All values. Who said that? Well, you, you're supposed to sit closer if you want a book. <laughs> Do you want a puzzle book or best practices book? Best practices. Best practices. All right. Thank you. There you go. You're welcome. Um, yeah, as uh, though so the underlying type of this enum class is int. Um, we have to try harder to use it wrong. One of my meetup members described this as being uh, in a pit of success. And he said that he got that from some other author. I don't, I don't know the genesis of that phrase. Um, but you, know, you, you have to try, you have to work at it. Well, it feels like you have to work at it, but yeah. Wait, sorry to do that? Okay, and that will work? Okay, so we were just told that I don't have to use a static cast, I can just do widget curly braces seven, whatever minus 42 as of C++ 17, and the compiler will accept that. That sounds like a failure. Why was that added in 17? What did I miss? Uh, I have to be careful to not get feedback from the speaker. Uh, okay, so you can create bytes out of constants. Uh, okay. Um, question. That makes sense, actually, kind of, yeah. Uh, we have an online question. Yeah. What if the factory function is an API exposed by a DLL, would exactly. smart pointer still be used? Yeah, okay, so if it's a function exposed by a DLL, yes, you can still use smart pointers. You do have to be, well, I promised that I would not mention ABI in this talk. Um, <laughs> But you have to be aware of your ABI boundary in that kind of situation. But yes, you definitely can. And in fact, where I have most done code like this is actually loadable modules that you load that introduce new types that might be created from a factory function. And that, I should probably look at the camera since I'm speaking to the person who asked the question. Um, 
uh, and then that definitely raises all kinds of questions about what is the input parameter set here and where do the types come from and who knows. Because in a DLL, you can absolutely extend a class that was defined in a different DLL and do things. Okay, so this is better. Uh, what about error handling? We, we, we could talk about this for probably the remainder of the 34 minutes that we have. Uh, what happens if I return a null unique pointer? Is that an error? Do I throw an exception? Um, how do I report what kind of error happened? I don't know. I, a, a very few things about this make me particularly happy. Uh, because I feel like you always have to check the thing returned from make widget to see if it's null. Because we don't have any guarantee that I was not returned a null unique pointer here. Uh, even if I were to mark this like, you know, no accept or whatever, right? <clears throat> uh, is it possible to fail to create a widget? Probably, we don't know. We don't have any way of communicating that. Um, should it throw an exception or not? Exactly all the questions that I just mentioned. And exactly, I got ahead of myself. We'll come back around to this in a, in a little bit though. Okay, so never return a raw pointer. Raises too many questions. Who owns it? Who deletes it? Is it a singleton global? I don't know, don't return raw pointers. Consider some sort of wrapper, something that communicates this. We can make a zero cost wrapper around our pointer type and say, I'm handing you an owning pointer or a non-owning pointer or a whatever, something that you're supposed to clean up, something that I'm expected to clean up. We can communicate that with types. We can use not null pointer if we want to from the guideline support library. We can communicate this. Um, and have a consistent error handling policy. Oh my goodness, please have a consistent error handling policy in your library. We want one consistent method of reporting errors in your library or making it very clear to the user. Like there's a few things in the standard library that have a throwing version and a non-throwing version, right? Um, dynamic cast, it's been around forever. If you pass a pointer into dynamic cast, then you get a pointer back and it's up to you to check it to see if it's null pointer or not. If you put a, pass a reference to dynamic cast and you can't do the dynamic cast, then you get an exception thrown. But this is the API theoretically makes it clear as to what's happening here. Strongly avoid out of band error reporting. Do not make the user of your library call get last error to find out what error happened last. Why not? Because nobody does it. Because nobody does it. Thank you, Marshall. But <laughs> I'm going for a slightly more specific reason than that, too. Threads. You just destroyed the ability to make your library multi-thread friendly. Um, we, do, we don't like, I mean, you know, error no. That is actually a thread local as of C++11. Technically, it doesn't have the threading problem. That doesn't make it a good solution, though. So we want to make errors impossible to ignore. Uh, I say don't return an error code. I would prefer exceptions, because they are quite impossible to ignore unless you feel like wrapping everything in try catch dot dot and then carrying on with your life. But the real point here is that, uh, that I don't have actually a bullet point for is you don't want it to be possible for your application to get into an unknown state. If there's an error and it's possible for the user of your error, or, uh, user of your library to ignore that error, now your library is in an unknown state. That's bad. And please don't use optional to indicate an error condition. It does not convey a reason, and the reason becomes out of out of bound, out of band. Yeah, I meant to put out of band there. So. It, returning an optional from your library just makes your user go and try to call this get last error, or they don't check whether or not the optional is set, or every single function call into your library gets wrapped into a, you know, if the optional is set, then continue with normal code flow, or something like that. Does anyone have strong opinions about this? 
Is anyone disagreeing with me at this point? Exceptions are slow. Only if you actually throw a lot of them. Exceptions aren't real time safe. That is true. That's a different condition for your uh, library. Still don't return optional in that case. Re return something like expected. Something that forces the user to not ignore the, re the error condition. Have an expected type that is no discard and you know, make the user say, did an error occur here and deal with it. Interesting, that's when the cameras came out. Expected is, should be const expert friendly, right? Please tell me it is. It is? Okay, good, thank you. Question. Uh, yes? What about preconditions? How to report broken preconditions? How to report broken preconditions? Um, well, I'll give an opinion on that. Uh, well, that's a good question. We didn't get contracts, right? Um, you, you're still gonna have to deal with it some way, right? You can't return, you know, you, you invoking, well, let's just say over the next rest of the slides, we will, um, we will kind of talk in a circle around that issue and hopefully make it harder to pass things that have broken preconditions. One more question. Yes. If std expected is C23, what do you recommend today? Um, it is, well, first of all, you can download an implementation that'll work with your compiler today. That's not difficult. Uh, you could do something like a variant of error or return value. That's effectively what std expected is. Um, but, it, or create your own version that's similar. It's not. It's not an overly complicated concept, I don't think. Although, I might have standard library implementer, implementers in the, lib, in the room who would disagree with me on this. No, okay, and I'm not getting disagreements from them. All right, summary so far. Better naming, no discard. All right, picking up from there. Never return a raw pointer. Provide consistent, impossible to ignore error handling with in-band reporting of what went wrong. F open. Is this easy or hard? Do you, oh, is that a question? Should I get a book? Is it gonna be a good question? What do you think about error code? Stood error code. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to talk about stood error code in here. I, um, I've never used it in real code. I've watched several presentations on it and felt like I never really fully understood how I was supposed to use it in real code. I have to be honest there. I don't know, is there someone who wants to make the defense for stood error code? You can have the mic for a second. Is anyone going to? Seriously, you wanna make a defense for it? Well then, come up here to the mic, make a defense for it. Are you willing to do that? We can turn on that mic, right? Cool, that mic will be turned on in a second. I, and I'm not gonna argue with you at all because I don't feel like I know enough to argue with you. Well, it solves the problem of having different error code domains in okay. a way that works pretty well effectively. I agree that trying to implement your own uh, genre of error code is a little weird boilerplate that you have to do. But other than that, actually using it in practice is, is fairly easy. Does it, have, it has good ergonomics once you've actually gone through the boilerplate work. Yeah, I mean, like if you're using ASIO, you're using it a lot. Okay. And so, or at least something like that. I've used the boost version a lot, but uh, you, get, you get system error codes. I have my own error codes. You can extend it. It works well. And it's easy enough at like runtime or compile time to do a switch and say, well, if it was this error code, then do this kind of scenario handler kind of thing? I don't know about context work. But definitely runtime. Oh, that's right. I don't think it is const expert capable, is it? Hmm, I don't remember now. Yeah, okay. you, can, you can look for your exact error code type. You can print it out nicely. You can print out the category, which goes to, I mean, it's a little awkward. It has to go back to some static name for the category type. But oh, right. But mostly, aside from those 
it's a little weird, you get used to it, and then it's easy. Okay. And it, and it works. Thank you very much. Do you want a, one of these books? Sure. Go ahead and pick if you want a puzzle book or a best practices book. Just go ahead and grab one. We have a question? Yes. Oh, a question in the audience. You're pointing yes. Go for it. Wait, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, so for the factory function that's not supposed to return null, can you use the factory function, or excuse me, the GSL not null wrapper? Yes, absolutely, definitely. And a question from online. Okay. Several. Uh, Several. Does uh -oh. this mean you think it's the library author's responsibility to enforce exceptions happen if they do in client applications? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Is it the library author's responsibility to make sure exceptions occur in client applications? To make sure exceptions occur in client applications. Um, I, I think the way that I'm gonna phrase my response is similar to what I've already said, or as, as the, the subtitle is, it's the library author's responsibility to make your library hard to use wrong. And that takes creativity sometimes because you have to decide is that an exception? Is it an expected? Is it a stood error code? Is it whatever? Uh, that's, I, I don't know if I'm, I feel like I'm just repeating myself. I'm not sure if that's an appropriate answer, but what's the, what's the next? Uh, uh, what about a structured binding with no discard? A structured binding with no discard. Oh, uh, yes, so with, with most compilers today, and I know I have an idea where that question's coming from because when compilers first supported structured bindings, they were not very good at this kind of warning reporting. Um, with compilers right now, if you destructure the return value from a no discard function, as long as you use at least one of those elements, you don't get a warning. It used to be that you had to use all of them, otherwise the compiler cried to you. And uh, last question, what yes. about, uh, about std optional? What do you mean by out of bond or out of bind? Out of, out of band, band. Uh, so it, it's the, by out of band error reporting, I mean, if you, someone, um, if you get back an optional, then you're forcing the user to do a separate function call to find out why you got a, an, an empty optional. So that's that, that separate action is what I mean by out of band. I want, when you call the function to know now what kind of error occurred. Because again, threading issues, uh, and just in general, because the user is going to ignore the, the error code if you make them call a different function. Okay, uh, F open, easy or hard to use wrong? Easy. Easy to use wrong. F open, the humble, the humble F open. And I know, yes, my meetup members gave me a hard time for this because, yes, this is an old school POSIX function and this is how APIs were defined back then. That doesn't mean we can't learn something from it today. Um, how is error handling done in this function? Error no, I think it's error no. Null pointers, is that what you said? Wait, what's that? Wait. Pair, but yeah, pointer and error note, okay. What happens if I drop the uh, return value? Leave an, uh, an error, an open resource, yeah. Uh, what is the format for mode? It's practically a DSL, really. <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit more. What happens if I call this? That's correct, right? What happens if I call this? Crash, Crash. yeah. Uh, so this, by the way, is a violation of a precondition, which is why I said we'll kind of dance around this topic more. Um, how would you rewrite this? Oh, yeah, go ahead, you raise your hand, yeah. Uh, did you say path, wait. Like a, a, a path name object. A path name object, okay, right, right. Um, and what else? Enum class for the mode. I don't know if we can get away with that because mode is big and weird, but. 
What's that? Uh, oh, no, no, wait, no, I'm sorry. Now this is falling down. I've got three different people talking. You started talking first. Make file a value type instead of a pointer so that if you drop the object, you don't lose the resource anymore. That is that is a vile option. There's someone over here. Make an enumeration. We'll get back to that in a second. Okay. Uh, this is a solution, by the way, for those of you who are not used to the versatility of unique pointer. You can pass your own deleter for any kind of pointer thing. Uh, so we can start to just make a wrapper, if you will, around here that's a little bit more modern and still work with the operating system API as it exists. Um, so we all, I think, still agree this is hard to use wrong. We've already commented on this. So we would do something like this, perhaps. I think this answers several of the comments. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, can I make a using declaration no discard? That's the ultimate question. And uh, no, uh, not in any way that I know of. I don't think the grammar would allow that. Okay, so this is easily swappable parameters, these character pointers. I'm gonna start moving slightly faster to see how far we get into this talk. Two or more parameters beside each other of the same type are easy to swap. Claim tidy has a check for this. Bug prone easily swappable parameters. That solves all of our problems, right? It solves, some <laughs> it solves some problems. Okay, so. It solved no problems so far. I, I, at compile time, I have no way of knowing if that's a path or a random string? What is the fundamental problem? Why does this compile? Explicit, in, implicit conversions. Um, I will attempt to hear what you are going to say, yes. Both of them are strings. Who actually first said implicit conversions over here? Do you want a book? You're getting a puzzle book. It's my object lifetime puzzler book. Thank you. Sorry, shameless self-promotion again. Okay. Um, it's the fact that these exist, right? There are implicit conversions. This is greatly simplified just for the record because both of these are templated types. Um, but path, file system path and string view have implicit conversions from character pointers. This compiles. It's implicit conversions. So, next item, avoid implicit conversions slash use strong types. File system and path appear to be strong types, but they're not, because we have implicit conversions in a tangled web between const character pointers, string, string views, and path types. I think that this is a mistake. Um, Conversion operators and single parameter constructors, including very attic uh, constructors and constructors with default parameters, definitely should all be marked explicit. So now, yeah, you might have for your construct uh, your constructor, const expert, no discard, explicit, something, something, no accept. It's entirely possible, yes, yeah, sorry to whoever said that earlier. Question. It would be great if the standard library issued a warning if the move constructor will not be used just because no accept was forgotten. Is there an easy way to ensure such guarantee when developing a library? Um, you're, right now your compiler, if you're running good static analysis on your library, your compiler should catch in the case that you have an implicitly or explicitly deleted move constructor. Well, if you have an explicitly deleted move constructor, you won't get a warning. An implicitly deleted move constructor should give you a warning with modern tools. This so is I would about say, missing no accept. Um, oh, missing no accept specifically, sorry. 
Does anyone have an answer to that? I don't know. Okay. Okay, so the comment was Clang actually does give you currently a warning on this. And it's a really annoying and templated code because you sometimes end up wrapping types that are not movable and you have to revert to a copy. But can you not use a conditional no accept? Oh, yeah, that sounds bad. Uh, so the, co the comment was, it does still issue a warning even if you have a conditional no accept and the condition happens to resolve to false. Yeah, uh, well that's, hmm, okay. Uh, that sounds like that could be better handled by your analysis tools. I haven't run across that myself. Okay, so just I want to throw this out here. Has anyone seen this kind of construct? You have seen this? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm guessing most of you probably haven't written code like this. This uh, auto parameters, that's C++ 20. You could make it a template function just as easily. This is implicitly a template, C++ 20 implicit template here. And I'm basically creating a catch-all. I'm saying if you didn't pass me exactly a file system path and exactly a string view, then I'm gonna fail to compile because it's gonna catch this explicitly deleted catch-all. You get a compile time error. I don't think so. Yeah, he said if I have to pass an explicit string view, then I've lost the benefits of string view. And I said, I don't think so. Uh, no, it's not a problem that the return type is missing because this function's never gonna be invoked. It's the compiler's gonna catch it anyhow because I deleted it. So uh, this is actually a, a reasonable way to do this. It looks weird, but it's a reasonable way to do it. Um, yeah, okay, so you could, you could play with this if you wanted to. I don't have a problem with this because it's not very hard to call string view braces and explicitly create a string view. To me, the strength of the string view is not the fact that they can be implicitly created. The strength of a string view is that it can take any string-like thing and I don't have to have a template to take any string-like thing. So, delete problematic overloads. Any function can be deleted. If you delete a template, it becomes the uh, default match for any non-exact parameters and that prevents implicit conversions. So the new items, use stronger types, and avoid default conversions, and sparingly delete problematic overloads. I'm guessing if you go back to your job on Monday and start typing a bunch of equals deletes to avoid implicit conversions everywhere, your coworkers aren't gonna be very happy with you, but this is a tool to make our libraries hard to use wrong. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand, not for him. Okay, yeah. How should our new f open function behave if it fails to open the file? I, 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 well, I would have it throw an exception personally, but it could be an expected whatever. All the same rules are going to apply. Just make it so it's an impossible to ignore error. That's all I ask of you. Yeah. If the thing that I'm trying to delete is in a namespace that I don't own, is it a good idea to jump in their namespace? No, uh, ooh. So you're effectively asking, might I do something like uh, namespace std open curly do the delete of a thing? You're gonna be in the world of undefined behavior if you do that, technically speaking. I would not recommend it, no. You could, 
you could do something, I think, like uh, you define it in your own namespace and then pull it in with a using declaration. Well, but then STD would have to be an using declaration too. I wouldn't do that. Um, yeah. I don't know, I think I would be reluctant to muck around in someone else's library to do this, unless it was a very big problem in your code base. All right. So let's back up a little bit to this. Yeah, oh, uh-oh, yes. Does the equal delete thing, you could do it in a debug program. Okay, so Marshall said since equals delete finds things that compile time. You could do it in your debug builds on your CI and not in your release build, so you don't have to worry about the potential UB or whatever might happen in the release builds, but still catch it. I could see you could even add a, a third target that's just catch my screwed up conversions build target. And never run it. And never run it. It's an interesting idea. Okay. Um, we, uh, sorry, yes, this is a slide that I haven't presented yet. I've got eight minutes and 40 seconds remaining. Um, we could do something, make this templated, by the way. This is the slide that my, or before this, that my meetup wouldn't let me get past, was yeah, we could do a templated, strongly typed object thing and just eschew the whole question of whether or not it's an all pointer that's been returned. I agree, if you're in an environment where this is possible, then do this, and you can even put a requirement on it and say require the thing passed to me is a base of, or excuse me, is derived from my widget type, and then let the, the factory do what it knows how to do, possibly. Um, are path name and mode optional in this case? Uh, yeah? Oh, wait, a question about which? I'm getting away from the speaker. Uh, so the question was, how do I fix the problem of an incorrect widget type being passed here? In this case, you're just gonna catch that at compile time. If someone were to pass in something that your factory doesn't know how to create, boom, it can't compile. So this is ultimately the best strategy if all of the possible things that you might throw into here are compile time known. And then you can if you need to like load from a configuration file all the types of widgets that I need to create, then you can do a translation from the loaded value to the compile time value. Uh, if, uh, the question was, what if I static cast 42 into here? I can't. This has to be a type known at compile time. I can't static cast 42 to a type. This is a template function that takes a widget type and it's a widget type that must be derived from widget. Compiler, this is by far the safest that I know of, compile time checked way to do something like this. Like I think we could play this game all day and I'm, you're not gonna find a way that's, because it's, it's, it's really difficult to fool the compiler here. Okay, um, so our path name and mode optional they're not, we already mentioned if you pass an all pointer to either one of them, it's undefined behavior, program crash. Uh, so these are, I'm just gonna say for you, easy to use wrong. Which leads to only pass raw all pointers for single optional objects. So I ask, is str optional in this function? No, why would I be doing an assert on it if it's optional? No, it's not optional. Um, is str optional in this function? Yes, it is. I have two different code paths. I check to see if it's there, I do something, otherwise I do something else. This is the only situation where I would say you should use a string to pass to a function. I have actually a stood string const pointer pointer. Did I do that on purpose? I don't think so. Maybe I did. I don't think so. Okay. Um, but in this version, like this is completely unsafe, right? If you're past a pointer, we're talking about making your library hard to use wrong, right? 
If you're past a pointer inside your library, you have to check it to see if it is a valid pointer. Because you're protecting your user, like this precondition question, I would say we're talking about making our API hard to use wrong. We're, we're you know, we're, we're trying to check our preconditions. Or not do this. What is the alternative here, by the way? Pass a reference in that case, yeah. Prefer reference parameters for not small, not trivial objects. Um, that's, that's a much bigger conversation than we have available in the next four minutes and 18 seconds. So if you're passing an int by const reference, you've probably done something wrong, okay? If you're passing a string by const reference, then we're probably okay. So don't pass uh, smart pointers unless you need to participate in lifetime. I'm gonna have to just move past that one. Okay. So where we are at is avoid passing parameter, uh, passing pointers uh, in general, but only pass them for single optional objects and avoid passing smart pointers just as a general rule. There is one problem left here which we have danced around a bit. Uh, what is the possible set of inputs to mode? I said it's like a DSL, it really is. Uh, so this is from the Linux man page for fopen. When passing for individual flag characters in mode, let's see, the glibc implementation of fopen and freeopen limits the number of characters examined in mode to seven. Uh, in glibc prior to versions 2.14, it was six, which is not enough to include possible specifications such as RB plus CMXE. It is effectively a DSL, right? Um, current implementation of uh, FD open parses at most five characters in mode. So uh, it's all over the map here. And like I started this by saying, we can always count on POSIX APIs for inter interesting discussion. Seriously, I mean, again, I don't blame them. It was how things were done then. But I can, from the standpoint of someone who teaches C++ best practices, I can literally pick any POSIX function and make like a day class about it. Okay, so we're back to this. I think we agree that there's still ways to make this easy to use wrong. I don't have the delete in here, but if I did, um, we're gonna have to qu discuss the question of, is it possible to make some sort of compile time type checked set of things that we pass for our mode instead of just a string? A CTRE library for this? Yeah, yeah, Hannah's compile time regular expressions, like the concepts that she does where she actually parses things at compile time. I would say yes, probably, but just like even regular expressions, sometimes you need to make a runtime decision about what flags or what the regular expression is. Um, let's just say, uh, I'm very much running out of time, I wanna finish my point here. Maybe this is truly an open-ended and OS-dependent stringly typed thing. Let's just say for argument's sake that this is the API we can't do better. What should I do to this API? I'm looking to you, Marshall. You would add overloads. No, that's not the answer I wanted at the moment. What's that? With bit? Bit fields. Yeah, uh, yes, bit fields are possible, but then it becomes complicated if each operating system has its own possible set of bits that could be set. Is it? Sorry, I have to move forward to this slide because I'm out of time. Fuzz your interfaces. Do you agree, Marshall? Okay, thank you. Um, so a fuzzer is a tool that tests your API against a set of pseudo random inputs. It generates inputs based on uh, feedback from the runtime, basically. You need to run them with address and undefined sanitizers enabled. To me, this is the, the next most important state thing that we need to make sure we address here. Fuzz your API, because this finds all of the creative ways of using it wrong that you never considered. Um, it can be used with literally any API creatively. If you dig into fuzzers, you're gonna think it only works with things that take string inputs. No, no, no. Just get more creative, talk to Marshall, you'll be fine. Um, and I'm past time, but 
Use better naming, no discard, no accept. Consistent impossible to ignore, in-band error handling, strong types, avoid passing pointers, limit your API as much as possible, and fuzz your API, and make your API hard to use wrong. Oh, and enable it for const expert unless you really have a good reason not to, okay? So that's me. I'm officially out of time. You can come up here and chat if you would like to, but otherwise, thank you very much for attending my session.